Hey guys, welcome to the boardroom. Great to have you here again today. I am pumped today. Our guest, real, 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 real big following on Twitter. He's been around the block a lot, writes for The Motley Fool. He's a financial educator, huge YouTuber. He's an author. He wrote the book, Why Does the Stock Market Go Up? Which is a client, a question my clients ask me all the time. He's phenomenally, uh, I'd call him full of wisdom. Uh, I, I went through his Twitter feed today and it was like, I was like, I was reading my dad, uh, not to, not to try to age you, Brian, but uh, let's give it up. Brian for Aldi. Brian, thank you so much for being here today. Rob, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Man, it's great to have you on the show because you've done kind of a, a lot. You've done everything from, you know, videos and books and just kind of daily comment about what's happening in the world and emotional investing. And, you know, you do also have a finance MBA, so you could back the back, you know, to talk to talk and walk the walk. How, t tell me about the journey. Tell me how it started. Um, I, I read from your bio that you didn't know what you wanted to do kind of way back in the day, 20 years ago. You didn't really know what you wanted to do. And then you just kind of decided you'd start spreading financial awareness. Yeah, uh, I'm still figuring out what I want to do. So if you if you if you can figure that out for me, that'd be wonderful. I'm making up as I, as I go. Uh, but like so many people, I was taught very little. Uh, if, if if not nothing formally about money and investing. And, and I say that as someone that graduated from college with a degree in business, despite the fact that we studied business, we studied accounting, we studied law, we studied marketing. We did not talk about the stock market at all, compound interest at all, savings at all, or any of the real core personal finance tenants that need to happen. That My, my love affair that I had with personal finance, money, and investing was developed after I left the, the classroom. It all started for me in 2004 with a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that my dad had handed to me as a graduation present uh, for, for uh, graduating a college. I consumed that book within a matter of days and I've just been on a never ending reading binge ever since with anything to do with money, um, investing and personal finance. I've been sharing uh, my thoughts and lessons that I've learned since I've been investing in the stock market for almost 20 years now um, on social media and I've been a writer for The Mighty Fool for about seven years. That's phenomenal. Uh, it's, the rich dad, poor dad story is one I really, really love. My dad was in the business. He was an investment banker. And I like was so passionate about this stuff. I used to ask him at the kitchen table all the time, dad, explain to me why a company would pay a dividend and why they wouldn't pay out all their profits. Why would they only pay out a part of it? Or, or just all these questions that I was asking my dad. And I felt lucky enough to have someone spend time with me. But you're right. I left high school. I left university. I also have a finance MBA. And I was like, when are they going to teach me? When are they going <laughs> to teach me about asset allocation and removing emotion from investing and making sure that your portfolio is set up so you could sleep at night and all these things. And there was none of that in, in like seven years of university that I did. Um, and I'm glad that you touched on it yourself. So then currently then, do you, you, you talked about investing in other ventures or businesses. Uh, did I read that right? You have other business ventures, then your, your kind of your YouTube career and your, your Twitter career. Uh, so what I, what I do for a living. So now I, I primarily make my living off of, uh, YouTube writing for the Motley Fool, uh, my, my book, um, and a course that I have that teaches people how to read financial, uh, statements. So, uh, that's how I, I, I make my, my living now. That's awesome. I'm actually starting a course, uh, the Tatro Academy. I've been working, it's, this has been bugging me so much. I think we're about the same age. I don't know, but I graduated university in 2003. So we're probably close to the same age. So we kind of came through the same where there was nothing available online. And then you were kind of one of the first to give all this information and uh, good on you for kind of educating. Uh, what, what do you find is the weakest spot in the, the US or North American consumer when it comes to financial, personal financial information or knowledge? So much. I mean, we learn from from our parents. I mean, the school system generally believes that you're going to learn personal finance, the home, the same way that you learn cooking at home and sewing uh, at home and how to raise a family uh, at home. And of course, there is a huge role for those things to be learned uh, at home. But I just believe that there is a massive, massive need for a more formalized education, uh, ed financial education to enter uh, the, the school systems, even if it just talks about the extreme basics, just about the core tenets of personal finance that we all know, and they're obvious once you hear them, right? Uh, spend less than you make. Uh, have an emergency fund set aside. Debt is bad. Uh, uh, avoid it. Cash is good. Uh, make sure that you you save it. Uh, have a long-term uh, career plan in place. Find out what skills you need to develop that will become more useful on time. Basic things that if people just understood those core principles, I'm sure that they would do far better with money than they would otherwise. And the default rate on these credit cards that these 20-year-olds are getting would be a lot lower as well. 
Brian, so now you write for The Motley Fool. I've, I've read a whole bunch of your articles. That oftentimes you're talking about specific sectors or specific stocks or specific ideas. Do you find that tougher than kind of giving the, the general advice that you're, you were just kind of giving now? So most people know me online because of my personal love affair with the stock market. And I love thinking about business models, reading through SEC filings, making individual stock uh, investings. I absolutely love everything about individual stock picking. However, I firmly believe uh, two things. One, your personal financial situation is an order of magnitude more important than what stocks you choose uh, to buy. And then two, for 99% of people, they should have no, they should not buy individual stocks at all. That's not because they're not smart enough to be able to do so. You just need to be able to do fifth grade math to learn how to pick um, individual stocks. I say that is because in my own experience, 99% of people that I know have no interest in learning about uh, stocks. They have no interest in reading uh, transcript calls, reading through SEC filings, uh, thinking through business models, studying their own psychology. The concept of investing their money just bores them to tear. For those people, I say, no problem. Just index and call it a day. But if you are in that 1% of people that is intellectually curious about this stuff and does like to spend their free time reading about and thinking about this stuff, for that 1% of people, I say stock picking can work. What about the ones in that 1% that actually can't, shouldn't be buying stocks because they actually can't handle the volatility and or the burden on their shoulders of actually being the one picking the stock and living with the consequence? Yep. So, saying you can handle volatility and actually being able to handle volatility are two entirely different things. And it is it is so true that the only way that you can really find that out is by putting your capital on the, the line. Uh, the, 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 if there was a positive from the extreme volatility that we've learned over the last uh, uh, three years, it's that a whole bunch of people that never invested before became investors and a whole bunch of people that never invested before experienced a significant drawdown. Um, in, in, in their uh, investments. That is where you discover whether or not you are made up to be an, an investor. It's put, putting your capital at risk and then seeing that capital eviscerated. After that process, are you interested in stocks? Are you Have you been able to sleep at night? Did you learn something about yourself? If this has been a horrific experience for you, you aren't meant to be an investor. Uh, if, if, if prices are declining and you're foaming at the mouth, interested in buying more, then you are made to be an investor. Yeah, that emotional cycle is tough on most retail investors. I think guys like you and I and, and gals out there that are portfolio managers, we salivate at it. We, we, we think this is phenomenal opportunity, phenomenal buying opportunity. You tweeted out yesterday that volatility transfers wealth from those who can't handle it to those who can. And I, I can't think of a more apt comment to make than what's happening kind of in this extreme volatile market right now. That's yeah, it's so true. The, the way that you build the most wealth in the market is by buying when nobody wants to own stocks and by selling when everybody wants to, to, to own stocks. That's very, very difficult uh, to, to do. But as stock prices come down, all other things held equal, the businesses and the stocks become more attractive, better places, more, more, more exciting places to put your capital and to invest. And inversely, the higher stock prices go, the lower future returns will be and the worse the time it is to invest. That, that is a simple thing that is easy to understand in theory, very, very hard to execute um, in, in, in real life. But volatility has a way of unnerving people. They don't like seeing big swings in their portfolio. They're just not apt to handle it. If big swings uh, make you cause you a tremendous amount of mental pain and you can't sleep, you're going to buy at the top and you're going to sell at the bottom. And that is going to transfer wealth to people that do the exact opposite. Yeah, guys like me. Um, I want to talk about the U.S. Fed. We've gone through a phenomenal inflation cycle. I mean, it's not something we've never seen. It's it's a significant inflation cycle, but it's not unheard of. Do you think they're doing a good job, or do you think they're kind of like the, uh, you know, the buddy at the party who who does uh, too many uh, cannabis edibles, and next thing you know, he's taken on way too many, and he's he's really really high. Uh, I think in general, it's very easy to critique the Federal Reserve, given given the enormous 
a uh, burden that they have on their shoulders for setting interest rates, reading data, and making decisions with tremendous political pressure on them from from all sides. That is that is just like a very very tough job, and it's easy to Monday morning quarterback and say they made a bad decision at insert insert uh, the the date. By and large, I think that the Fed has done a decent job. Do I wish that they would have acted differently? Of course, of course I do, and there's no doubt that the Federal Reserve has had a massive massive impact on on asset prices uh, that we've uh, that we've uh, the big swings in asset prices that we've uh, seen it. So if I was to give them a letter grade, I would guess I would say B, B minus. So room for improvement. But on the flip side, that's a job that I would not want. Should have started earlier, I think is what you're saying. With tightening? Yeah. Yeah. I wish they did it in the two th in the 2010s. <laughs> okay. Now you talk real quick there about the US Fed and, and how tough their job is. How do you find you know, they're supposed to be completely independent from the government. And in theory, they are. And how do you find that uh, you, you marry fiscal policy with monetary policy and the fact that, you know, we have people that lost their jobs and they needed money and we needed to give them benefits. We needed to print money. And the fact that we knew that that would likely cause if we didn't do it, there likely be inflation. And now we have the inflation because we did what we did. And now we got to hammer people with a recession again, because this is going to cause a recession, right? The, the macroeconomics are pretty close to voodoo. I mean, trying to suss out what is going to happen on a macro level, even when it sounds extremely logical, is extremely challenging. I vividly, vividly remember 2008, 2009. We were pumping billions and trillions of dollars uh, into the US uh, economy to save banks, to save AIG, to save auto manufacturers, to keep people in their homes. We were pumping unprecedented amounts of money into the economy. And what was the drumbeat from Fed Hawks? They're saying, this is going to cause unbelievable inflation. We're going to have, uh, we're burdening our, our future generations with massive amounts of debt. All logical things, right? Inflation, 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 wait for it. What happened next? There A decade of the yeah. lowest inflation rate on record, right? Explain that to me. How, how did that happen? That just shows me how hard how how hard it is to suss out what's going to actually happen in the economy when you're reading just the the inputs to it. Uh, conversely, we had pretty low inflation even in 2020 and in 2021. It's only in the last year that we've seen massive inflation spike up and really um, rear its ugly head. Is this just the bill? from 2020 we're paying now? Is it the bill from 2008 we're also paying now? I, I don't know the answer uh, to there, but it's, it's, it's easy to say the Fed did ABC, therefore XYZ is going to happen. When it comes to macro things like that, uh, I think it's far more complex than you could possibly imagine. Still gave him a B grade. I'd say that's not bad. You probably believe that they're, they're likely going to be able to figure this out over the next year or two. I hope. We'll see. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh, so you, you mentioned debt. You mentioned that it's pretty simple, accumulate cash, debt is bad. What would you say to the investor that continues to leverage a safe asset like a home and uses a lower cost of capital on his home, is prudent with it, and invests in a higher yielding return like a balanced portfolio? I would say there's there's nothing wrong with that if that suits your your philosophy. Um, there's a big debate in the in the personal finance investing community. Should you pay off your home or should you not pay off your home? AKA, should you use a very low interest rate, likely maybe three percent, maybe four percent? Does it make any sense in the world to pay that off early when you could use that same capital to put it into the stock market or even perhaps even the bond market and earn a higher return um, than that? This to me gets down to just a core philosophy question, and I truly believe there's no right or wrong answer to it. Mathematically speaking, it makes no sense to pay off all your debt. Agreed. Mathematically speaking, it makes no sense to pay off your debt. I personally paid off my mortgage. Why? Why would I? Would I possibly do? Why would I? Such? Why would I sink money into an asset that is going to have a low relative return when I could likely take that money and put it into the stock market where I get a higher return? Uh, you know why? It makes me feel good. It helps me sleep at night. I took my That's large, the answer. My single That's the answer. largest expense, my single largest fixed expense, and I eliminated it for life. That and makes you, me happy. You feel good about it. Yes. And, and, and what's the point of money? What's the point of it? Why are we investing in the first place? It's so that we can live the life we want. Period. End of story. 
for me, that included, I, I, I live a better life knowing that my mortgage is gone, regardless of if my actual net worth would be higher today because I took some other action. And I think, I don't think it's a 50, 50 split. I think there are more than 50% of the people I think that are in your boat. I think, and I'll be honest, I'm on the other, I'm in the other boat. I mm -hmm. feel better about myself knowing that I have max leverage on my home. I don't leverage anything else, but I leverage my home and I'm increasing my balance sheet because, you know, my debt is here, but my assets are growing faster. And I, that makes me feel good. Great. Now, whenever I have this discussion with clients, I never say, I use the word mathematically all the time. I love that description because you're right. It's not a math question. It's a, how does it feel in your heart question? And I think there's probably 60 to 70% of the people that I think would agree with you. I, I, I see, I see nothing wrong with taking either, uh, either rand. And you could actually, you could actually also argue that if you were able to lock in a rate of say 3% or 4% with inflation, the way it's going now, that debt that you have is almost an asset, an asset that itself is being uh, eroded away and you're paying off with future dollars, which will be um, inflated. There are mathematically paying off your mortgage makes no sense. It's just an emotional decision. Yeah, I totally agree. One million percent. I believe I've done a video on that before. Uh, real quick, real estate investing. What's your take on it? Have you done it? Would you ever take out, you know, a hundred grand, buy a, a condo or a duplex down payment, use the capital to, to use the rent to fund that mortgage? Is that something you do? You you preach? Uh, if if that suits your personality, uh, I think a real estate investing can make a whole lot of sense. There are tax benefits to real estate investing. You're investing in a tangible uh, asset. If you know what you're doing and you can do short-term rentals, you can actually get higher returns on, on your capital. Uh, for, for me personally, that does not match my, my personality. If I ever had to, the idea of managing a property or managing somebody else that manages a property and potentially dealing with kicking out a tenant, if I had to evict a tenant, I would have the worst month of my life. Like I would be throwing up nonstop. Like I would just, I would feel sick to my stomach. So no return, potential return, potential tax advantages would be worth that, that emotional cost that I would have to pay. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I personally avoid real estate beyond my, in my, my house. And I do think that investing in real estate investment trusts or REITs can make a whole lot of sense. But if your personality is suited to real estate, I think that that could be a great asset class. Good diversifier too. You talked about real estate investment trust. So I'm a big believer in those that follow my YouTube channel know that I preach alternative assets as a core holding uncorrelated assets. They're true diversifiers, they're inflation hedges, real assets, and that can be uh, infrastructure, real estate, but I preach it through typically through private pools or through limited partnerships or stuff like that. So you don't get the day-to-day -day volatility. So someone wants to buy real estate. I tell them, why don't we take that hundred grand or that quarter million? And why don't we give it to the best portfolio managers on, on the country, in the country, on the planet, and let them kick the tenants out and change the locks and increase the rents and deal with inflation and interest rates. And you just said that's something that you, you think makes sense in your portfolio as well. Uh, so I can't speak to private doing you do that them privately. Publicly. I can think I can speak to doing that uh, publicly. And uh, private real estate is not something I've ever uh, looked at. So the, I'm, I'm specifically speaking about public real real estate investment trusts. But uh, generally speaking, the real estate asset class has some fa fa fascinating opportunities. And if you can, if you know what you're doing, it can be a great place to park capital. It just is not suitable for my personality. Yeah, I think we've averaged kind of 12, 13 percent in that space over the last 10 years. So sounds good. And clients have, you know, with much less worry. volatility too. Yeah, no volatility. Uh, crypto. What's your take on crypto? Uh, for years, I was against it. Uh, I, I really, it really took me a long time to warm up to the idea of even even putting capital into the crypto uh, market. At this point, I think that it there's there there are legitimate reasons to consider a different asset class, um, and I would put that into just a, I would just mentally allocate that to be in anybody's speculative portion of your por portfolio. Um, if you are bullish on fill in the blank cryptocurrency, and the bulls are right. You could earn 100x return on your money, right? You, you could just earn ungodly returns on your money. And for those kind of investments where there's no cash flow, there's no real way for me to track it, um, there's no real way to measure the intrinsic value, um, I would just go into that kind of asset class knowing it was a speculative it was a speculative bet. And I'm okay with making speculative bets so long as you position them uh, appropriately. I own an, a teeny, teeny, sub 1% 
uh, position in Bitcoin and sub 1% position in Ethereum. I could see myself increasing that um, over, over, over time, but I see no reason to go whole hog uh, on, on either. But if people want to invest in crypto, um, I don't poo poo them in any way. Another thing that we have in common. Yeah, I'm about one and a half percent on each. And, uh, you know, I think it's Sounds it's, logical. Yeah, sounds logical. It's an asset class. It's diversified. If it goes to zero, I'm okay with it. It is yep. part of my speculative bucket. I have about 10 to 15% of my total portfolio in speculative assets. Some of those have gone 10, 20 X. Some have gone belly up. So uh, not everyone wants that experience. That obviously. is the space. That is crypto. And you have to just know that going in. Um, I want to do an asset allocation. I want to spend a little bit of time on asset allocation if we can specifically in a bear market. And I don't know if this is something that you preach and I, I'm reading again, I spent some time on your Twitter feed today. You talk about your core investing beliefs, right? Invest, don't trade. I can't time the market. You've said that stocks are safe long-term, but they're short-term, there's volatility. You've said that markets are volatile. You should plan accordingly. So how does this play into your personal asset allocation? And you know, if you were to say stocks, fixed income, either alternatives or, or real estate and maybe cash, or other, what would that look like for you? And what do you preach to people? So uh, first off, I'm, I'm 40 years old. So this is my current belief. And I'm thinking of myself. I personally have no plans to ever not work. Like I can imagine myself, quote unquote, working until I'm 80 or 90 years old, simply because I ha get, get tremendous joy out of uh, doing so. Uh, the other thing that I believe is that stocks are the best the best place for for long term uh, uh, capital. Uh, moreover, if you've looked at the last fifteen years, bonds have paid nothing, like absolutely nothing. We might finally get to a case where bonds are worth considering at some point if interest rates continue to rise. So, with all of that in mind, uh, my current asset allocation is first. I'm going to start with my personal finances. Ridiculously conservative. Ridiculously conservative. Multiple sources of income. No debt. High savings rate. Six month emergency fund. That is the starting point for me. Uh, secondly, that that extreme conservatism there allows me to be extremely aggressive with my investment portfolio because my extreme conservatism with my personal finances enables me to absorb extreme amounts of volatility. Volatility is mentally taxing, but it in no way impacts any part of my real life, my day-to-day -day life. Um, so because of that, I am essentially 100% stocks, essentially 100% stocks. I have a little bit of cash um, in there, a tiny little bit of crypto uh, in there, but I am 100% stocks because my personal finances are so conservative. Over time, I could see myself potentially layering in fixed income. I, I could see myself increasing my exposure to say real estate investment trusts or even potentially alternative uh, assets. But over the last 15 years, bonds have made no sense. No sense to me at, at all. It looked like um, return free risk. <laughs> return free risk to me uh, over the last decade. If that changes in the next couple of years, I might be willing to change my tune, but that's my current strategy. I swear to God, you've been watching my YouTube channel because I've been pounding the table. I've been in this business about not quite 15 years, but I've been very anti-bond for a very long time because I would say, why would you want to own a 10-year piece of paper that's going to pay you at best 1% if there's no defaults? <laughs> you got to pay tax on that in Canada. Anyways, you got to pay tax on that income. And you're left with a guaranteed negative rate plus the fees on the ETFs or the funds. You're guaranteeing yourself a negative return for 10 years as a best case scenario. Yeah. Like, why would anyone own that? If anyone yep. understood, they would not buy that piece of paper. If someone actually understood what they were buying, they wouldn't do it. And yet, I would see portfolios all the time, these 60, 40 portfolios. I saw a tweet from you about how the 60 portfolio, you know, it's not right. It's, it, you know, it could be right for someone, but it's probably not right for you, I think is what you were saying. But, um, at bonds, I also agree with you that bonds, for the first time, we are starting to look at bonds here. We're starting to look at, hey, if we can get a 6% coupon or five and a half or who knows, maybe we'll get six and a half at some point, you know, you can make a pretty strong argument that that makes sense for some individuals with very little volatility. But we're finally getting there and we haven't for a long time. Yeah, not to mention that. Think about the last 10 years uh, for, for the bond market. Well, what happens when, to bond prices when interest rate rise? Oh, yeah. I mean, they go in the wrong direction. The biggest not only were you locking in a very, very low rate for a long period of time, you've likely gotten walloped in, in a theoretically safe asset over the last 10 years. The largest uh, ETF in Canada, uh, XBB, I believe, the largest bond ETF, or anyways, the largest bond funds are all down 12 to 16% this year. Like so much for diversification, so much for why do you own bonds? Do you own bonds to produce income? 
do you own bonds to diversify or do you own bonds to protect? Well, it's, it's done none of those three in the last 15 years. It's not produced any income. Mm -hmm. It's not diversified because when stocks went down, they went down. And it hasn't protected your capital because they've had a volatility of, call it half of what stocks have had. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, makes a very, very tough argument to own them. Now, we've had some small positions in certain uh, certain bonds, but I totally agree with you. The, the risk, what did you call I, it? I All look the... forward to the day when bonds are a legitimate potential alternative to the stock market. All the risk with no return, or something like that. Would you call it? Uh, uh, Buffett. Buffett said that I stole that from him, but he he called um, bonds and treasuries uh, return free risk. Return free risk. Hey, I like it. I, I'm nothing wrong with stealing some good quotes. Um, here we're running out of time. Here, I do want to finish on a couple topics with you. Uh, what do you think the housing market in North America is going to do over the next whatever? Pick a period of time. Twelve months. Down. You think it's inflated because of interest rates, or do you think because you think uh, interest rates or you think the recession? I, I live in the suburbs. The, 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 the amount that uh, prices around here have been inflated is not the worst in the country by by, by any stretch. Uh, but prices here would make it hard for us, uh, even a dual income family to reasonably afford them at modest interest rates, let alone higher uh, interest rates. And I, I see nowhere for the housing market to go uh, but down from here. But like so many predictions, uh, I have no idea if that's going to come true and I wouldn't bet money on it. Now you've said many times on your Twitter feed that you know when the market corrects, you just buy if you're able to, and you allocate if you're able to. Do you feel that way about the market? Uh, you know, at a 30% correction, kind of like we're seeing now on the Nasdaq or 20, 25 on the S and P. Is that is that what you're advocating? Someone has cash. Nothing has shaken my conviction that the stock market is where I want to put capital that will be locked up for five plus years, and that includes the recent um, recent events that we've seen. All right, one more question, Brian. In a year from now, currently the S&P 500 is at 3613, 3600 call it. Where do you think it would be a year from now? Well, if I look back at my own history with trying to time the market, I am horrible at it. Truly, truly god awful at it. Um, and that, this is one reason why I don't predict uh, things. And I don't trust people that do, uh, quite frankly, because there are so many unknowns, so many things that could go right or could go wrong. Uh, having said that, I will certainly play along and I'll say 3,300. 3,300. Okay. Still, still a bit of time yet. Um, last question, two questions for you. I see that you have, uh, you're a New England Patriots fan, I believe. Uh, who's going to win the Super Bowl this year? Kills me to say it, but the Buffalo Bills. Josh Allen fan. And finally, no, not a Josh Allen fan. I just, I just believe that they're one of the best teams in football. <laughs> okay. Thank you for pointing that out. And, uh, major league baseball. Who do you think is going to win the world series? I, I follow nothing about baseball. So I'll just say, can you name a team that's in it? The Toronto Blue Jays. The Blue Jays got to win it all. I like it. Great call. Thank you so much for being here. Follow him on Twitter guys. He's a phenomenal follow. Great wisdom. Great posts almost every day. He's got a newsletter as well that you can read 42,000 plus people read that newsletter 400,000 people follow him on Twitter thank you so much for being here today Brian thank you very much Rob thanks so much for having me